Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here today to speak at the university. I come to speak to you about global warming uh, and climate change and energy. Right now in this very city of Warsaw, not very far from here, the United Nations is meeting to discuss man-made global warming. I'm sure as students, you've all heard the arguments, or at least are familiar with them, that mankind is destroying our atmosphere, that we have reached a tipping point, that we must act to stop global warming, or in many cases, we are doomed. That's what you will hear over and over. And that the United Nations can save us. They will tell you here at this conference going on, the United Nations will tell you that we need an agreement to prevent bad weather, that we need an agreement to stop future typhoons like the one that hit the Philippines from hitting again, that we need a UN agreement in order to stop tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and drought. This is the scientific message you are hearing, that our use of coal, gas, oil is creating a climate catastrophe. And I'm here to tell you, in very polite terms, that it is nonsense, it is silliness, it is madness to think that the United Nations can control the weather through treaties. It is madness to think that rising CO2 levels is the tail that wags the dog of the Earth's climate, be it global temperature or global weather. Now, at this meeting at the United Nations, they have a man on a hunger strike, Webb Sano. He is not eating all week, this is the past two weeks, in order to put pressure to get an agreement from the United Nations. Indirectly, he's putting pressure on Poland to sign on to what the United Nations wants to do. And I will be talking here in a moment about the immorality of what the United Nations is doing to countries like Poland, to countries like India, to countries in Africa and South America and India. They are basically telling you, you must limit your energy use, limit your use of coal and gas in order to save the planet. And this is where the United Nations comes, to the politics comes in. And, and the science is very politicized. Well, first of all, who am I? I am Mark Morano. I used to work in the United States Senate Environment Committee. And I, was, and I published Climate Depot, the website. I urge you all to check it out. It's uh, climatedepot.com. It covers global warming and energy. And my title today is, Can the United Nations, can governments around the world control our climate through agreements? Can they control our weather? And I think you'll find that many people in our past have thought they could control the weather as well. Let's start with the political agenda of what's happening here in this very city. The United Nations has a climate panel called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You may have heard of it. This, along with Al Gore, the former U.S. Vice President, won the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, a political prize, in 2007 for raising awareness of global warming. But what you may not know is this is not a scientific body. This is a political body, a purely political body, posing as a science body. These, this is predetermined science. In other words, they must make scientific statements because the politics and the government panel behind it demands it. They know the science ahead of time. They know what they're going to say. Connie Heldegard, the, the EU climate commissioner, has come out just two months ago and said, even if they're wrong on the science, we're doing the right thing by policy. So what they're telling Poland, what they're telling uh, the developing world, listen, it doesn't matter whether we're right about man-made global warming, we must pursue these policies of limiting energy, of limiting emissions. This is the height of silliness for them to actually admit this, that it's not about the science. This is about them wanting central planning. And I will be blunt with you today. Poland has endured German domination. Poland has endured Soviet domination. Eastern Europe has endured this. The greatest threat to your freedom today 
comes from what's happening at the United Nations today. Former Czech President Václav Klaus was very blunt. The greatest threat to personal freedom in the world today is environmentalism, what he called ambitious environmentalism, extreme environmentalism, that wants to centrally plan every aspect of your life in order to limit energy, in order to, quote, save the planet from global warming. You need to be aware of this. You need to investigate the science for yourself. Poland faces a very serious threat from the same mentality of central planning that you, that you were able to shed uh, just two decades ago. Okay. Global warming bubble has been shown to be subprime science, subprime economics, and subprime politics. All three of the science, economic, and politics are flawed and politicized. So let's... In the United Nations, we have an MIT, we have very prestigious climate scientists who say ordinary people see through UN-sponsored global warming fears, but the educated are very vulnerable. And what I mean by the educated, very typically on college campuses, are the biggest activists, the climate youth groups, the professors who will, who will tell you that the science is settled, that there is no debate, that the global warming skeptics or people who don't accept the Al Gore United Nations view, they are the evil deniers. We were at the United Nations two days ago giving a press conference. We were asked by the UN activists, how do we sleep at night by opposing the United Nations agenda on global warming? Well, we sleep very well. Uh, some nights we can't sleep because we're trying to figure out how to destroy and roll back this agenda. The global warming movement. What happened to the science behind it? Well, this is a great visualization. You've heard about the polar bear scare. Well, this is the science of global warming. It's crap. This is where they've come out with. They basically will tell you rising CO2 is driving a climate doom. This is nonsense. The simplest way of thinking about it Next one. Uh, is, well, first of all, we had a ClimateGate scandal in 2009. The ClimateGate scandal, which you may, may have heard of, was the, the top-level United Nations scientists' emails were released. And what they tried to tell you was the United Nations was the last word on global warming. This was the authority. It turned out the small cadre of, of, of UN scientists were colluding with each other to exclude scientists who didn't agree, to exclude data that didn't fit the UN political narrative. They excluded studies about solar influences and ocean cycles and geologic studies that didn't fit their narrative. So other scientists have called what the UN committed science fraud. And so what's been happening? We've had no global warming. We were supposed to have an accelerated global warming in the last 15 years. The runaway global warming. Because we haven't had this runaway global warming, they've shifted over to this weather. All weather events are now the cause, are now proof of man-made global warming. Next. Other scientists, a Japanese scientist has now said, Man-made climate fair is now akin to ancient astrology. This is, this is where we are at the level of debate. Whatever happens now, the Arctic ice cap grows, the Arctic ice cap shrinks, we have flood, we have a hurricane, we have drought, we have blizzards and record snowstorms, we have record cold. It all confirms man-made global warming according to the United Nations, according to Al Gore, according to the global warming activists. A perfect example of what they call a pseudoscience or a fake science. Al, former Vice President Al Gore uh, claims that the record, record northern hemisphere snow and blizzards are completely consistent with man-made global warming. Well, why is that? In his movie that he won the Nobel Prize, in his book, he never once warned of blizzards and record cold and snow coming, but after the fact, they claim, well, this is what we expected. Why? Because all weather events are what they expect. In the, in the global warming science, what they've done is a very clever trick. And this is why we call it the level of horoscope, astrology. It's become tabloid. They make a bunch of contradictory predictions. Global warming will cause more snow. Global warming will cause less snow. Global warming will cause more droughts. Global warming will cause less droughts, more fog, less fog. Uh, malaria may decrease. Malaria may increase. And 
now no matter what happens, they can point to a study and say, hey, we predicted it. Much the same way your daily horoscope in the newspaper, which is always by the cartoon or comic section, will say, this may or may not happen today, this will happen, and at the end of the day, you say, hey, my horoscope was right. That's what the level of science that they've been reduced to. Now, they've turned this into a religious movement. And I don't say this lightly. They've turned belief in global warming and environmentalism, if you don't believe, they've turned it into essentially you are evil, you are one of the sinners if you don't go along with the United Nations. In Hollywood, filmmaker Oliver Stone said that hurricanes are now, quote, punishment. Mother Nature cannot be ignored. Al Gore has now said that every night on the news watching the weather unfold, whether it be a flood, a drought, is like a nature hike through the book of Revelations. He's saying that mankind is causing biblical end times in our world today. He's using religious language. In the United States, a peace professor, yes, we have peace professors uh, who wrote in a mainstream publication that we are looking at post-apocalyptic fantasies becoming everyday realities. Now, the book of Revelations in the Bible uh, envisions almost the exact same thing. This is the language they've done. This peace professor in the United States is talking about droughts, freakish storms, wildfires, conflicts, full-scale war, drought, <laughs> hunger, force millions of people to abandon their traditional lands and flee to the squalor of shanty towns. Do you see what's going on here? You must repent as a modern pole using modern energy with electricity and coal fire power plants and natural gas and oil. You must repent and go the way of solar and wind or you will end up in the squalor of shanty towns. This is religious imagery that they're using. Repent or perish. Our main newspaper in Washington, D.C., the Washington Post, just one week ago, ran an article urging people to repent for the sin of causing typhoons. And they said the typhoon which hit the Philippines was due to, quote, the moral evil of climate change denial. Do you see where this is going? The, the environmental left is co-opting religion. They're co-opting people of faith's language, their holy books, and they're turning it, they're perverting it, and they're bastardizing it for their political ends. Suffering and the sin of climate change denial. This was in the Washington Post. Her name is, the she's a theologian. Susan Brooks Thistlewaite. Superstorms, like hurricanes and typhoons, aren't an act of God, but an act of willful disregard for God's creation and the neglect of human responsibility. So now there's no more acts of God. Tornado, floods, droughts, hurricanes. These are acts of your sins for having high-definition TVs, for having smartphones, for using electricity. The best way of looking at it, this is they've, in, they've morphed the United Nations and modern environmentalism. It's all the trappings of religion. It's original sin. Mankind is responsible for these prophecy disasters. Uh, the need for atonement, for repentance. They've essentially said, because of global warming, many bad things will befall you. And guess what? Bad weather events happen all the time. So anywhere on the globe at any given moment, they have more proof of global warming because, hey, there's a drought in Australia. Hey, we had a heat wave in Moscow. Hey, we had a flood in uh, Colorado. Uh, and so everywhere you go, look at this. There's more. We told you bad things would happen. It's, it's, it's the level of your daily horoscope and climate astrology. Burn in hell. The New York Times, I'm sure you've heard of the premier paper of record in the United States. Their premier columnist, Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman. Those who deny global warming. In other words, if you don't accept the drivel, nonsense, and silliness happening uh, in this city at uh, this week with the United Nations, their view of global warming as a man-made catastrophe, if you deny the United Nations science view, you may, quote, be punished in the afterlife for doing so. In other words, you will go to hell. This is fire and brimstone preaching. Denial is now a, quote, inconceivable sin. You are sinning against Gaia, Mother Earth. This is a new form of earth worship. 
UK scientist Philip Stott put this the best, from the Babylon of the Gilgamesh to the post-Eden of Noah, every age has viewed climate change cataclysmically as retribution for human greed and sinfulness. Now, that's an accurate observation of human history, but we're supposed to be in the 21st century. We're supposed to be rational, scientific people. But what the United Nations is trying to do is roll back the clock to medieval times, and I'll show you how. One of the things the United Nations is claiming is that global warming is causing prostitution in places like Africa. It's causing women to be sex workers, to be hookers, to, be, to go out and solicit uh, sex for money because of global warming. And they're saying because of a drought, because families can't farm in certain areas, this is because of your coal use in Poland, in Europe, in the United States, that women are forced into prostitution. Next. Next. In the United States Congress, House Democrats have reduced, uh, introduced a bill saying that global warming is causing women to go to transactional sex for survival. In other words, if there's if, uh, is an increase in prostitution, this is now blamed on global warming. And since you are all responsible because you have your smartphones, because we're here with coal-fired power running our electricity, we are responsible for women turning to prostitution. This is the absurdity of the arguments that they're making. This is a resolution in the United States Congress, the once hollowed halls of the United States Congress. So now we're told there's a way to fix this. A UN treaty can fix this. Carbon taxes, which Australia is now throwing off, can help women from becoming hookers. And we will get to that in a minute, but here's another one. When you fly in an airplane, you want proof of global warming? When your plane bounces up and down, what we call turbulence, when you go through a storm, that is now evidence that mankind is driving global warming. We have a United States Senator from the state of Michigan say that she knows global warming is real because she feels it when she's flying. The storms are more volatile. So when you're in the next time you're in an airplane and the plane bumps and, and moves around, you now have personal proof. You've experienced, you're now a climate refugee in the sky when you have a storm. Our president, President Barack Obama, has made the most absurd, inane, silly, unscientific claim when he was running for re-election. He actually made the implication that we can vote ourselves better weather. He told Americans they could go to the ballot box and vote for him to improve the weather. You think I'm kidding? He actually said in a speech on September 6, 2012, climate change is not a hoax, more droughts and floods are not a joke. They're a threat to our future. And in this election, you can do something about it. Get that. You can vote for him to stop droughts, floods, and wildfires. This is truly the madness of our age. I urge you, as children, students at a university, to investigate the United Nations claims, to investigate any professors who tell you the debate's over. Look at these professors with a very skeptical view. Don't insult them, although it may have to come to that, because the professors, many professors and universities are die-hard, committed, global warming believers and won't uh, allow debate. President Obama claims we need to repair our deteriorating climate that threatens future generations. He believes that acts of the, of the United States Congress and the United Nations can repair the skies. We have a, a senator who's the head of our United States Senate Environment Committee. She's from California. Yes, she represents Hollywood and, and, and the land of make-believe. The day we had an outbreak of deadly tornadoes in our state of Oklahoma, she went to the United States Senate floor and, and warned that scientists warned that these tornadoes would happen. And she touted her carbon tax uh, as a way to prevent future tornado outbreaks. In other words, a carbon tax would have stopped these tornadoes. That's the implication here. Now, the shocking thing is, sometimes they're right. President Obama, when he was running for president, said his presidency would be the moment when the rise of the oceans begins to slow and our planet begins to heal. Yes, he actually predicted that his election would slow the rise of the seas. Well, next panel. Oh, I got it here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Maybe there's something to global warming religion. 
Because within two years of President Obama's, um, within two years of his inauguration as President of the United States, sea level, not only did he slow the rise of sea level, sea level actually dropped. NASA, our space agency, announced that the sea level was dropping a quarter of an inch. President Obama, hallelujah, fulfilled his religious prophecy. He predicted if he would win, sea level would drop, and it happened. <laughs> this man has powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. And for those of pop culture, that's the old Superman introduction. And they'll try to claim that we're in a new normal. I'm sure that the weather was never like this before. We have scientists, Scott Mandy, I say, I gave a talk, and all the people believe they've never experienced weather like this in their lifetime. Well, guess what? The Earth is geologically billions of years old. And we're going to look at our time frame and say, oh, the weather's never been like this. But let's play their game. Even if we look at the weather within our lifetime, within the last hundred years, the United Nations claims Al Gore and others fall completely flat. Tornadoes are down, big tornadoes are down dramatically in the United States, which has the overwhelming majority of all tornadoes. Droughts, 60-year decline in droughts. Floods, there's no trend up to 127 years. Uh, and there's no evidence of more severe flooding during the last century. On every metric, the typhoon in, in, uh, in Philippines, this actually was only the 58th, was the 58th superstorm to reach that uh, power uh, since 1950. It was one of 58 storms, and most of those 50 of those 58 storms happened before 1987. So big typhoons are actually on the decline since 1950. But you don't hear that in the news. You think, well, this is the new normal. This is because of our smartphones, because of our SUVs, because we're driving around in Jeeps. It has been foretold, uh, this is a uh, fortune teller. This is what the science of the global warming activists have been reduced to. One scientist actually was very blunt. Roger Pokey Jr., University of Colorado in the United States. Uh, he's an extreme weather expert. He's disgusted by the claims of the political leaders of the United Nations. He's disgusted by the college professors. He's disgusted by the, by the global warming scientists claiming all this. He now says that the predictions of the global warming, the United Nations panel, have a similar status to the interpretations of Nostradamus and the Mayan calendar. Yes, it's fun to talk about Nostradamus. It's fun to read him. It's fun to worry about the Mayan calendar, the 2012 doomsday. But that's not science. And this is where the global warming movement has moved to. In fact, NASA, our space agency, has a lead scientist, James Hansen, who said Obama only had four years left to save the planet in 2009. Well, that expired in January 2013, and Obama never had an agreement, never passed a global warming bill in Congress. So our lead NASA global warming scientist joined the littered wreckage of the Mayan calendar in a failed doomsday prediction. But don't worry, they always come up with new end dates to their doomsday predictions. This is a witch trial. Why am I talking about witches? What do witches have to do with the global warming debate? During the Salem witch trials in the United States, it was during what we call the Little Ice Age. This was after the medieval warm period, which was roughly 900 to 1400 AD, and then the Middle Ages occurred after that. During these witch trials, women suspected of being witches were accused of changing the weather, and they were put to death. And they were told things like, we never had weather like that until that witch moved in next door. When you had the cold weather, the little ice age, you had crop failures, you had people starvation, you had devastation. So they were looking for a blame. They saw women and they blamed them for witchcraft. As I said, before that witch moved in, we never had bad weather or disease. In a medieval pope in 1484, we're now, just in case anyone wonders, we're 2013 currently. Tell me if this sounds familiar. This was Pope Innocent VIII. This is a medieval pope's version of today's global warming faith-based belief, faith beliefs. It is reasonable to conclude, just as easily as witches raise hailstorms, they can cause lightning and storms at sea. And so no doubt at all remains on these points. Today we're told 
the man made, there's no doubt that man made global warming caused by your sport utility vehicles, by your cars, by your smartphones, by your coal use, by your gas use. There's no doubt that this is causing storms at sea. Uh, Typhoon Haiyan, Yolanda, that hit the Philippines. There's no doubt on this. There's no doubt remains. The debate is over. The debate is settled. The United Nations Global Warming is borrowing a page from a medieval pope. Lower temperatures caused a statistical increase in witch trials during the uh, Middle Ages. And in 2013, blizzards, heat, droughts, wildfires caused an increase in claims of proof of global warming. Now, I mentioned earlier about central planning and the threat that uh, not only Poland and Eastern Europe, but the citizens around the world face from central planning bureaucracy and taking away human freedom. Controlling carbon dioxide, well, we inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide, is a bureaucrat's dream. If you control carbon, you control life. China, which is a one-party state, the New York Times has lauded it. They've lauded China's environmental policies because one party can impose politically difficult but critically important policies needed to move a society forward. Does that sound familiar? We don't need democracy. We don't need opposition. We don't need debate. We just need one party to move these policies forward. We can't delay. This is urgent. The earth needs immediate action. This is the New York Times. Our former House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi of California, once again representing California, the home of Hollywood, the land of make-believe. Every aspect of our lives must be subjected to an inventory to combat global warming. Does that sound familiar? Every aspect of your life has to be monitored by government to fight global warming. This is United States political leaders making this claim. The Japanese went further. Their environmental minister said, you must go to bed an hour early to fight global warming. The government is telling its citizens when to go to bed in order to reduce their emissions to fight global warming. You're wasting power by watching TV till very late. The government wants you in bed. And then maybe, maybe that's the link to prostitution. The more people get in bed, the more prostitutes. All right, I'm, all right, I'm being silly there. But the point is that it's the height of silliness. This is NASA's lead global warming scientist who just retired. This was the man in the United States that the American media feeded as the global warming expert, the number one scientist in the world, they would argue. James Hansen said people who don't believe his view of global warming being a catastrophe, people who don't believe the United Nations view of global warming should be subject, um, they're, he accused them of crimes against humanity. And he, he, he used the phrase not just for dramatic effect because it is accurate given the consequences to humanity. And of course, crimes against humanity evoke the Nuremberg Trials. And by the way, that's today's date, November 21st. Blood on their hands. Jeffrey Sachs, a special advisor to Ban Ki-moon, United Nations chief, said last week, climate liars like Rupert Murdoch, the media mogul in the UK, Australia, the United States, and the Koch brothers, a libertarian think tank, have more and more blood on their hands as climate disasters claim lives around the world. If you don't buy the science of the United Nations happening in your city right now, you have blood on your hands. Everyone who died in the Philippines is your moral responsibility because you didn't repent your climate sins. What does the United Nations want? I mentioned the greatest threat to your freedom since Germany and Russia are now long gone, is ambitious environmentalism, is the agenda of the United Nations. Christina Figueres, the, the climate chief, she's seeking a, quote, centralized transformation that's going to make life of everyone on this planet very different. Does that sound, let me see a show of hands here. How many want a centralized transformation in your life run by the United Nations central planning that's going to make your lives different. Who's excited about the UN transforming your life by central planning? Any hands? Come on. 
There must be one uh, left-wing professor here who uh, is willing to stand up. No? Okay. Now, if you don't agree, not only have you committed a moral sin, but you must be treated. In the United States, we have a professor, Kerry Norgard, who last year said climate skepticism must be treated. She said it is comparable to what happened with challenges to racism or slavery in the United States. So not only are you going to die, burn in hell, turn into a prostitute, a sex worker, not only are you uh, committing a moral evil sin, but now you must be treated and you're like a racist and you're like someone who supports slavery. It gets worse. This is a scene from The Incredible Shrinking Man. That's a giant... That's a tiny man who shrunk fighting a giant spider. In the United States, at New York University, very prestigious university, a professor of bioethics, Matthew Rao, has said that we can combat climate change through genetic engineering. Gee, genetic engineering? Where have we heard central planning bureaucrats ever use that phrase? Does anyone have any memory? of anyone trying genetic engineering or doing maybe medical experiments on people, Matthew Lau wants to have pharmacological enhancement of altruism and empathy. In other words, if you don't care about the environment, they will medicate you until you agree with them. They will dope you up. This is incredible. This man actually made these comments. His only caveat was, well, I'm not necessarily advocating this, but this is so important. I'm throwing this out there for debate. He says we can change our behavior through this medicine and we can shrink ourselves. He wants to make people smaller through genetic engineering because smaller people use less, will eat less, will, uh, 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 will have less of a carbon footprint, so to speak. Lost in this whole thing, well, first of all, just one note on the climate science. You're going to hear about CO2. There are hundreds of factors that influence climate. Everything from tilt of the Earth's axis to water vapor, methane, volcanic dust, ocean cycles, clouds, the solar system, the sun. All of these factors, hundreds of variables. The idea that mankind, at the very margin, can tweak CO2 and be the tail that wags the dog and be the control knob and be able to tweak CO2 enough to control storms is madness. And the way they want you to tweak it is by, trans by banning energy that works in favor of experimental energy of solar and wind, which isn't quite ready for prime time. Carbon-based energy, coal, gas, oil, is the moral choice. You must stand up for coal use and oil and gas. Don't let environmentalists intimidate you. Don't let professors intimidate you. Don't let the media intimidate you. Don't let the United Nations make you shy away. This is the most pro-human choice you could make. Carbon-based economies have been one of the greatest liberators of mankind in the history of our planet. It, life was nasty, brutish, and short. High infant mortality, short life expectancy, uh, no modern medicine, no modern dentistry. Carbon-based energy allowed people to leave the dark ages into the modern age. Be proud of coal use. Be proud of oil. And remember, Earth Hour, which happens every April, where we turn off your lights and symbolism with the Earth. It's always Earth Hour in North Korea, one of the last bastions of the kind of ideology Poles are very familiar with from your past. Electricity is the difference between the dark age and the present. That's South Korea, and look at North Korea with no lights. That's a satellite image at night. That is the result of central planning, and yeah, their lives were transformed, all right, in North Korea. In the United, in, um, in the UK, in, the, in England, they're already warning people because of the global warming policies advocated by the United Nations that the era of constant electricity is ending. You have to get used to power when it's available. Why is power becoming scarce? Because they're using a global warming con. They're bastardizing science. They're politicizing science in order to restrict energy, to ban coal use and oil and gas in order, in order to save the planet and stop typhoons. And this is the result. You can't get used to electricity. You can't watch TV at night. You've got to get to bed, get to bed early because you're wasting power. In summary, actually the United Nations, the U.S. Congress, 
or our Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. cannot control the weather. Any professor or greens who imply this or tell you this is no better than medieval sorcerers. That's my website. I conclude on that note. I hope I, um, I, hope I gave you a lot of food for thought. I urge you to investigate the science of global warming and the policies of global warming. Don't, as young people at university, don't mindlessly accept the man-made global warming narrative. All polling data around the world shows young people are the most b committed believers to what the United Nations is selling because you've been exposed to this at a very young age. I urge you to check the science. I urge you to keep an open mind. Thank you very much.